So um, when it comes to routine operations like iterating, functional programming is known for its high level abstractions that hide many details because the code is shorter. As a result, there are fewer areas that need to be tolerated. Um, our speaker is a computer science professor at the Federal University of Technology, Parana, who works at the Curitiba campus. He teaches logic for computer science, agile methods for software engineering, research methods and introduction to functional programming. He has a YouTube channel called Eliza Alang and the Beam with Adolfo Neto. He recently gave a lightning talk at the Alang workshop. Um, details will be provided later on in the chat. And is a co-host of three podcasts, all of them in Portuguese, also will be provided on the chat. So in the following 60 minutes, Adolfo demonstrates learning functional programming with Elixir. Thank you very much, Adolfo. The floor is yours. Wow, thank you very much. Great introduction. Thanks for the invitation. Well, I, I believe I, I need to share my screen, right? Okay. And I'm going to share my whole desktop because I want to show more than my slides, but I I want to be able to see, yes, you if necessary. Oh, okay. So the title of the stock, oh, there is something happen, happening to, yes, now it's better. Okay. Um, the title of the stock is Function Oriented Programming with Elixir. And as it was already said, my name is Adolfo Neto. The overview of this talk is going to be who am I, why Elixir, what's a mathematical function, functions in programming, and if you need, you can ask questions during the talk. You don't have to wait until the end of the talk. I believe the talk is going to last at most 30 minutes, maybe a little more, but not sure. And as it was already said that I'm an associate professor at the Federal University of Technology, Paraná. Here you can see a picture of the, the Curitiba campus where I work. I live in Curitiba, which is this city here. It is, this is a beautiful park we have here. But I was born in Maceió, Alagoas, which is a city with beautiful beaches. And you can see here the Brazil map. I live here in Curitiba. The most famous city in Brazil is Rio de Janeiro. And I was born here in Maceió. And I, 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 when I think of, of Africa and Brazil, we were together um, a long time ago when this was the reality. So you see, we could go to from Brazil to Africa, or to from Curitiba to Kenya, it would be not that far, but you know, that's no, that's not possible. It's very expensive to travel abroad and during the pandemic, it's very complicated, but I really would like to visit Kenya someday because of these people here. You see here on, on the right, you see a Brazilian runner, Joaquin Cruz. He won the Olympic gold for 800 meters. But these people here, this is this guy is great. I, I don't know if you here, if you everyone here knows the the names of these people. If you know, type in the chat. But this guy won gold for. The same, it was the same race that, that this Brazilian won, but it was later. Okay, no, no one typed in the chat. So the name of this guy is Dave Rudisha. He he won the gold during the Olympics, I believe it was the London Olympics, and he set the new world record. So he's great. It, and this guy was very famous in Brazil 
a few years ago because he would come here in Brazil to run a famous race that would have the São Silvestre race, and he won it many times. I'm not sure how many times, but maybe five, six times. His name is Potter Gat. He's also from Kenya. And these girls here, they just won the marathon in the Olympics. So the, I, Paris won the, the gold and Brigitte won the, the silver, which is an amazing feat for runners the, of the same country to own both gold and, and silver at the Olympics. So that's, you know, uh, probably it's the same in Kenya. In Brazil, we don't know much about Kenya and probably in Kenya you don't know much about Brazil but that's because you know that's how things work in most countries but uh, I, I, I think you should know that at least we know that Kenya has great runners and I know that most of the great runners from Kenya come from the Rift Valley and you probably live most most of you in Nairobi, but the Rift Valley I, I was looking at on Google Maps. It's six hours by car from from Nairobi, so it's very far. But okay. So I teach Introduction to Functional Programming at the. This is the name of my university, UTFPR. It's this the acronym, and I had I, ah if. This is a course that I, I teach. It's free for everyone that wants to, to attend it. And this year I had a student from Italy, another one from England, maybe next year, maybe someone from Kenya wants to attend this course. It's a more academic focused course. And I use Elixir as the, the language, the main language. As it was already told, I'm part of three podcasts, and I just want to say that this is a podcast about Elixir in Portuguese. Of course, you know, there are many podcasts about Elixir in English, like Elixir Mix. I have been a guest there twice. There is also Bing Radio and Thinking Elixir and Elixir Wizards. I love podcasts, and I, I love that there are many Elixir podcasts. I'm a member of the Education, Training and Adoption Working Group of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. I believe everyone here is already a member of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. If you are not a member of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, please join, it's free, and you have access to, to the, the great Slack channel. You can uh, ask things you uh, for instance here the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation gives scholarships for people to attend events like uh, Elixir Conf Africa and Code Bing and so on and uh, as it was already told I have a YouTube channel Elixir Erlang and the Bing with a, a dolphin net oops and there Recently, that there was this talk, this great talk by Simon Thompson about language processing in Erlang, and there is also another talk here about uh, property-based testing by Laura Castro. You should definitely, definitely watch these talks. And why did I choose Elixir to teach functional programming at UTFPR? Oh, basically because it was. It's a language that was created by, by a Brazilian, and that's how I got interested in functional programming. I, my background in, is in computer science, but I was mostly interested in logic for, for computer science and then on Azure methods. So I was not, I, I can say that I'm still not a functional programming researcher. I'm not. I'm most, most interested in the Elixir community. And then I decided to teach functional programming using Elixir because I like Elixir, not because I, I love functional programming. And there is this question. What's a mathematical function? And 
one thing I, I really like to do in my classes, and for this I need to use my my yes, I have to set it up here. And okay. Yeah, this this comment. One thing I, I'm a teacher and I like to use uh can you see you you can see my my whiteboard, right? So when I teach my students what is a function, I, oops, let me change the color to become more clear here. I like to give this example. So I have two sets, A and B, and I have a function from A to B, and let me establish here some elements. So, a function from A to B would be something like that, f of A, f of B, f of C, and I have to assign, now I, I change the color, assign each element of A to exactly one element of B. So f of A is 1, f of B is 2, f of C is 4. You see, I don't need to to cover all elements. Ah, these sets here, they have a name in mathematics. This is the domain set. This is the range set. And we can, you, you have to cover all elements of the domain must have, must be associated to one element of the range, exactly one. But no, not all elements of the range must be covered by, by here, by some, must be the image of some element of the, the function. And the, the question is, when we think about functions in, in functional programming, we, we really don't use that very much. So, when you define a function in Elixir, for instance, or in any functional programming language, you are not associating values. So that's what I, I started studying. And then I found, let me go back to my slides. Go here, I have to click on present. I found this book by my friend Walter Carnielli and also Richard Epstein, Computability, Computable Functions, Logic and the Foundations of Math. So this book is actually about, uh, it ex explains how functions are seen in mathematics, not in computer science. So the first thing about, um, let me go back to the first thing about functions, mathematical functions, is that the, the functions are seen as black boxes. You just know that for each input, there is an output. And that's very important for people that do functional programming is that for the same input, the function always give the same output. There is no choice. You can choose, oh, now I want uh, this function to, to have uh, this output. And after that, I want that output. So that means that, um, let me just add here. Yes, no, I would like to add something. Oh, okay, I'm going to add here. So, oops, the, uh, for this I'm using Livebook, which is a, a great software by Jonathan Klosko, I believe. No, I want to add not, I want to add a section, yes. So do you want an example of what is not a mathematical function? 
that, what's the name of that function? Shuffle, I believe. Yes. So I have a, a list with three numbers. One, two, three. If I run a non shuffle with this list, one, two, three. So this is a function. This is the input and the output is three, one, two. Now I'm going to reevaluate. Now the output is one, two, three. Now it's two, three, one. So you see in computer science, in programming, even in a functional programming language like Elixir, we are not dealing with only mathematical functions. That's uh, a, a one of the points I have here. So I started to think about this, about how functions in programming are different from functions in mathematics. And I created this, this diagram here. It's, it's still a work in progress. I have not finished this. And that's what I'm going to open here. It's a, a there's this link, it's on Miro. Miro is a, one of the advantages of being a professor is that you can use some software. Oh, I see there is some, oh, I, I wasn't seeing the chat. Uh, someone that has typed it, Rudisha and Poltergat. We know, uh, and, and Midigo Franco, you will know about the football in Brazil. Yes, that's the point. Uh, here in Brazil, we, we know about runners in Kenya and in all over the world, including Kenya, people know about soccer in Brazil. Uh, we say, yes, no, it's, it's only people in the US that say that's soccer, <laughs> but okay. So as I told you, mathematical functions, they are black boxes. They have domains and ranges, but uh, yes, this is a point I missed in that book. Epstein and Carnielli, they say that you can also see functions as rules. And that's what we do most in programming, functions as rules. We can also see functions in mathematics as collections of ordered pairs. In that case, let's go back to, to this example here. We would have something like that. So a function f would be something like, uh, a and one, B and two, C and four. Yes, but that's that's not what we do in, in computer science. So let me go back. So in that case that I have shown you in this example of here, the, the shuffle, enum shuffle, which is not a mathematical function, you know that shuffle only shuffles the orders of the elements of this list. For instance, if the result of enum shuffle were, were two, two, one, we knew we would know that something is wrong. So it's not that shuffle can give any result. It can give it. It's it can give a result in a set of valid results. So that's why sometimes we can see function in programming as relations. Another example, I don't know if I can do that in, in here is, let me add, because this is from Elixir, no, sorry, from Erlang. Can I, yes, I, I, I will have to maybe use IX. Let me increase the font size here. Uh, math, no, it's not math.random. Oh no, I believe it's because it's random. Yes, dot uniform. Yes, let me try that on live book. Random dot uniform. 
So random that uniform returns a number between a uh, floating point number between zero and one, but every time you run it, but it would be wrong if, if it gave me a number between, uh, no, uh, if it, the result were, were two, for example. So this is an example of not a mathematical function, but that returns something expected. And another thing that I, I, I notice about function in mathematics, and you see, I'm not a mathematical researcher. I, I just remember, I'm just remembering my, my years of studying logic for computer science. And I see that in programming, we have this focus this strong focus on the arity of functions. So that for instance, in, in Elixir, we may have a function, for instance, uh, called F with two arguments and F with three arguments. So these are different functions. Why are they different functions? Because they have a different arity. So that's one important point when you think about functions in programming. Naming functions. And this is also something that it's not that important for, for mathematics, but here we, we have to do it because, no, not that we have to do it. So the, the, the first examples here in this live book, let me increase the, the so here I'm defining uh, an anonymous functions. Fn of x returns x plus one. When I re re evaluate this one, it just, just returns a function. If I do that, I, I enclose the definition of the function in parentheses and I put a tree here. So I'm saying, oh, get this function, apply it, to three, three plus one is four. You can even give a name to a function, to, a, to an anonymous function, but when you give a name to an anonymous function, you know that you have to put a dot here. So that's why f dot three returns four. You have this very um, how contrived way to define a function. This here is saying that you have an argument, you increase it by one. So it's basically the same function. You see, it's the same code here, 44. It's the same code here because it's basically the same function. It's only a different way to write the same function. And you can also call it. And you can have this kind of function with two or more arguments. And that's how we do it in programming in Elixir. So you, you can define functions which are nameless or anonymous in functional programming. But of course, we want good names for our functions. We want our, the names of our, of our functions to be meaningful, to be as short as possible to be, yes. And I, I know the, the first language here in Brazil is Portuguese, in Italy is Italian, in, in Kenya, I really don't know, but I know that Swahili, Swahili is one of the languages. But I, I believe nowadays people are developing software with people from all over the world, so maybe the best way is to give names of functions in English. And another thing that it's very important in, for functions in programming is that we organize them in modules. So in this example, no, it's not, it's on Lifebook. Here you see that this enum is the name of the module and shuffle is of the, the name of the function. So, the name of this function actually is enum.shuffle slash one, because it has this version of enum has one argument. So 
this is important that we organize modules in so our, a module is a set a collection of functions and ideally the the modules should contain functions which are related so this is more the topic the the subject of software architecture and software design so i'm not google going to go much deeper here as well i'm not going to to go deep here in types because uh, you know that there are dynamic type languages like elixir statically typed languages like like uh, uh, haskell and there are some gradual typing for instance for elixir this is, but this is something that I noticed that people in math usually, I believe they don't care that much because it's it's already clear when you define a function. For instance, I, I teach logic and I define a function and I say, oh, the set is this one. The, the domain set and the, the range set is this one. So you don't care that much about this. And one thing that it's also available in non-functional programming languages, but that I really like is, let me add a section. So higher order functions. So what's a higher order function? For instance, if I have a function f such that f n of x is x, plus one and I have a map, no, a list, which is one, two, three. And if I call it no map of list and F, does it work? Let me try this. Yes, it works. So I have applied this function to all elements of list and the return is, is the, the, the values. So actually the, what I did for was I the, the new list was F of one, F of two and F of three. So that's what I did, but of course this is, oops. Let me leave it as a comment because that's not how it works. And the, the, the nice thing here is that F is a function and it's also an argument for, for enum map. So when, when you have higher order functions, you can, uh, a function can be an argument also you can have a function for instance now i'm going to define a module which i am call i'm going to call it higher and i'm going to define uh, a function f what is this function f going to do it's going to return that same function that i'm using all over here and oh no yes sorry i have to type n here so let me compile here yes okay i have a, a module higher and now i'm going to copy this but now uh, i'm going to call a higher f let me see if it works. I believe it's not going to work. No, oh, it works. It works fine. Yes, because it returns a function. You don't have to do that. That's probably the, the reason. But you see, this function f returns a function. And that's what is used to apply it to a map. So you can have a function that when you have uh yes that's let me 
when you have higher order functions, you have functions as first class citizens. They, they are just like any other value. They can be sent as an argument. They can be the return value of other functions. And there are many famous, famous between quotes, of course, of, of functions that return, that use functions as first class citizens that are higher order functions like map, reduce, filter. And of course, there are there is much more. I will not, this, this was part of a class in my introduction to functional programming course, but there is also the possibility of evaluation, strict and lazy, memoization, recursion, theory recursion, um, for instance, curing, which is not a good thing in Elixir because it's, it's not necessary. And one thing I, 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 I would like to, to finish here is because in other programming paradigms, you have, let me just add a section here. This, this even has a name. I, I don't remember the name, but for instance, in, in other programming language, you would have a state and this state is changeable. And then you do F with state, then G to state. And now your state here is different from the state in the beginning. But in a functional programming language like Elixir, you can have a state and then you call a function with some arguments to three and a state and you return the state also oh, maybe maybe a, a result and a state and then you apply it again and then you also have another a new state so you can be doing that several times. For instance, let me give, this is of, of course just comments. Oh, that's great. Uh, on Lifebook, you can do that. For instance, suppose you have the, uh, uh, Code Congo World Mutation. Mm, I'm not sure that that's the name, but, um, so suppose you have the state is, uh, is this, and then you you have a function, for instance, f equals to fn of x and y, it returns x. Let me try this first. So this is a function. Let me see if it works. Yes, it works. If I do that to an empty, yes, it's that's what I want. Suppose you have a state and then you apply it to F with three and then four and then five. Yes, the problem is that the first argument, yes, I have to, to exchange here. The, this is an improper list. Okay, see, I, I, I started my state with an empty list. Then I say, oh, add this to my state, three. Now add four, now add five. So with an, an initial state in a pipe, I, the return was uh, a list containing all the things that I wanted to add my state. So in this case, I treated my state as the first parameter of this function. And that's how you do in, in functional programming language like Elixir. But of course, in other programming languages, I, I believe Haskell is much more advanced about this, but I. I'm not an expert in Haskell. So let me go back to my slides. In transformation. No, I I really don't remember the name of this, this thing, but 
in the, that talk uh, I, by Simon Thompson, he gives another example where you you send your states with as a. There's also a, a, you had here Bruce State, and he he has those patterns of functions. Some functions are reducers, some functions are transformers, and some other functions are constructors. So a reducer receives something which is a state and reduces it and gives back a state. So I don't I, I know there is another name for, for this phenomenon, but I, I can't remember right now. So let's go back. So this is what I wanted to show that functions in programming, they have several features that first, some of them are really important only because you are dealing with a computer and you want to the execution of your functions to be as efficient as possible. You have a limited memory. In math, for instance, I, 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 I came from logic and computer science and there is a, a, a method called first table where you can say that any propositional logic formula is or is not valid, but it's great in logic, but it's for computer science, it's basically usually because it's exponential. Uh, Okot Congo asked, is Curie really supported in Elixir? And no, it's not. There are some libraries where you can do something like that, but I, I, I don't really, it's really good because the, the big difference between Haskell and Elixir is that in Haskell, all functions have arity one. They only take one argument. So it's easy to do curing in Haskell, but in Elixir, it's not the case. You can function with RT1, RT2, RT3, RT4. And that comes from Erlang, and that in Erlang comes from Prolog. So I, I don't think there is a big point in curing, because what's curing? Curing would allow me to do something like this. Let me go back to. For instance, suppose I have a function f, which receives two arguments, y, x, and y, and returns the sum of both. Oh, it's n here. If I apply f to two and three, the result is five. But suppose I want a function g, which is f applied to two, and then I want to apply g to three. And I would like this to return five two, but this doesn't work because this function f here expects two arguments. So I cannot do this directly as I could do in Haskell. So that's the, the idea of curing. But I, I see it's, I don't think it, it, it would be good for Elixir, but there, there may have some other reasons for these. You see, so if you want to stu study a purely functional language, Elixir is not your best, best choice. So this is my middle board. So if you have any questions, suggestions, anything you want to, to learn more, I suggest, I have a suggestion by myself. There is this talk it was two days ago, functional programming from a theorist, theorist perspective by Ria Mutafis, really nice talk. And if you want to know more about me, my site is this one, adolfnt.github.io. And I'm also on Twitter as at adolfnt. And that's it. I'm I'm here for your questions. Sorry, let me leave this here. Yeah, uh, hello. You you mentioned about um, there's this platform we usually teach students from from different parts of the world. So where is the plat? I mean, the university. I mean, is where's the platform? How how can it be accessed? 
oh sorry i i just i stopped sharing my screen you mean the the, you, the course i give i gave yeah in, you said you said it's free so how can someone access it that is uh okay oh first it's uh, it's this course it's I, i'm going to type type in the chats there it's this okay. course introduction to functional programming this is a course offered by the graduate program in applied computing of the federal university of technology and here is the syllabus and we basically we've had google meet se meet sessions and synchronous meetings for maybe it was 11 or 12 meetings and also we discussed many things on this course so it's not a recorded course it was uh, mostly a synchronous course but and, uh, it happens once a year this year it started on june uh, 17th and finished on september the second next year it will be probably around the same time and, and, and just a, a follow up with that. So you, you said that the main language you're using to teach this is Elixir, right? Yes. So, so the question is, uh, my belief is that Elixir is not a pure functional language, right? So, yes, so, it's so, not. so why, why Elixir then? Oh, oh yes. M my point is, is more that I like Elixir, <laughs> that there was even, there is this big, uh, there is this big functional programming conference. So these guys are, are the functional programming experts. I'm not. So there was a tutorial on functional, on teaching functional programming. Yes, it's here. Teaching functional programming by Michael Sperber. I believe it's already on YouTube. And he's, he, he told he, he said there, oh, you should not use your favorite language for teaching functional programming. Well, but that's exactly what I did. I did, I, I, I chose Elixir because I like Elixir, but it's it's according to, to Michael Sperber, who knows much more about functional programming than I do. You should not use your favorite functional programming. And do you what which do you think it's it's the fun, functional programming language he uses in his course probably haskell or, or lips i don't know not haskell not lisp not scheme not scala it's dr racket <laughs> not closure <laughs> so, racket was a, a compiler Yes, it, it, it's a, a kind of, of, of Lisp, yes. But I mean, the, the point is he wants to use the, the, the Racket program language, the, the, the environment. So he explains it. Let me share it with you the, the, the link to, I hope people. Some, some, talks on YouTube about this subject. Sperber is his name. Should put teaching. Yes, but here he gave a talk on Lambda Days, but I'm talking about this one, which is a three hour tutor. Oops. Yes, I'm going to type here. Right, so that's that's only my my explanation. Is uh, uh, um, my excuse is if it wasn't for Elixir, my students would be would would would, would be having no course on functional programming because I, I wouldn't be teaching functional programming using Haskell or or Doctor Racket or Lisp. Maybe Lisp, make closure. I like closure. So Jose Alfonso Morales wrote, I think it's it's good to add why in that function and, and in generating lecture, you're prepending and not adding to the end a new value. Uh, do you mean what? 
you mean this one, right? In... Yes, because I, I, I basically changed here, but the first one is Y, the second one X. Let me run it again. Yes. You mean that? Oh, yes, yes, I understand. Yes, but I, I, I believe, uh, Jose, uh, that the point is if, if you have a list called one, two, three, and you want to add a, a, a value to, to that list, it's less computationally expensive to add four to the beginning of the list than is it to... Because uh, I, I can't do that. No, I can, yes, I can. I could do that, right? No. Plus, plus. Yes, plus, plus. Yes, no, no, but I, I cannot. So this one is less computationally expensive than this one, because this one, you have to go to one, then to two, then to three, and then you add a four. If you have, have a list with a million numbers, then this can take much more time than this one where you just put it in the beginning of the list. I believe that's, yes, that's the, the point that Jose Alphonse, but you see, uh, Jose, uh, I usually don't like to, to tell my students that because, oh, uh, then you have to explain what is a linked list. And actually, when you, you are studying C, C++, you must know, I believe, I'm not sure, but I, I haven't been teaching C, C++ for a long time, but I believe you must teach, oh, this is a linked list, this is how we implement it. In Elixir, it's not that important, but that's a, a, a good point. So. Yeah, I have, uh, I have another, oh, sorry. Yes. I have another academic question with regards to Elixir still. So if, if you look at something like Python, right? It, it's very much academically accepted as in what, what I mean by this is that most universities teach Pythons and most researchers use Python and uh, and you as a you as a professor, I, I believe there's a reason why you choose Alexa. And I also saw that um, was it Dashbit or what, what was the company was trying to do some research with compiler using Alexa in Brazil. I don't know the exact university. I don't know your thought. So I, I don't know your thought about that. That is, what do you think about that? First, what's the question about Dashbit? I'm asking about, I mean, acceptability of Elixir in, in, in universities, because generally, like, uh, what, what do you think? Is there, as you see it, do you see it as something which will be soon embraced? Or maybe uh, from, from, from academic perspective, that is, as you see it? That is. Yes. Uh, first, the, the, the first point is that Dashbit is the company that Jose Valin created after um, Platform Attacked. Platform Attack was bought by Nubank, was acquired by Nubank. So I remember some time ago before Platform Attack was acquired, which is a nice way to say that it was bought because they wanted their professionals, not they want their business. And I, I talked to, to Platform Attack and they had no money for, for anything significant so um so this is not a, a a point here in brazil people there, there are many brazilians in the elixir community if you go to any conference code being america uh, elixir confu there's there's always some people from brazil giving talks and not all and i'm excluding valin here because valin is always there but other people some people I, I personally know, like Julian Elena, like William France, like Elaine Fatanabe. I believe even in Elixir, being Elixir Africa, Elixir Conf Africa, there has been talks by Brazil. No, I'm not sure because 
Alex Comfort Africa was different, right? It was the, the it only happened virtually and it was the first one. But okay, so my point is my this course here is an optional course. So the students at the university where I teach, you know what the, the, their first language in the computer engineering in the information systems course is? C. It's not even Python, it's C. They start learning C. Then they go maybe to C++ and Java. And if they choose this course, they learn Elixir. So that's one of the reasons I'm not so worried about this, the, the opinions of Michael Sperber here, because, okay, if we were going to teach a functional programming language as the first language, maybe Elixir would not be the best choice because we would be, I would be presenting Elixir to people who had never ever programmed in any other language, but in, that's not my case. My, in my case, I, I'm dealing with mostly graduate students, also some, some undergraduate students, but which are more advanced. And that's what, what I, I do here. I'm not sure I have answered all parts of your question. Did I? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Majority of it, yes. Yes, I feel, I feel. Yeah, it, it's okay. Okay, so this course here, if you want, you have to follow me on Twitter, and I, I say, oh, it's going to to start the, the. How can I say? You can register, because yes, the the problem is that the this course is. It's, it's go from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And 1 p.m. here, it's maybe, I'm not sure. If 9 is 3 p.m., 9 plus 4, yes, it's 7. It's from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. in Kenya, Kenya time. So. Maybe it's not the best time for studying, but it's free, completely free. And I would love to have someone from Kenya next year. You just have to fill uh, a small form and that's it. And of course, I'm, as I already told you, I'm on Twitter. Everything I do, I, I usually post here. And we, here in Brazil, we have a, a a big community. Ah, I was on Code Being Brazil as I gave a talk there. And there there was a talk by I don't remember their names, but it's here on, on the site. Yes, this is the site for Code Being Brazil. And there was a keynote by uh, Gary Orano in Okote Congo here. And also Brooklyn Zelenka. Yes, Brooklyn Zelenka is she's the one who created a, a library for doing curing in Elixir. It's a very interesting library. I don't remember the name, but I believe it's Witchcraft. Witchcraft. So Brooklyn Zelenka, she loves functional programming and other things that are only available in purely functional programming language. And she tries to bring it to here. It's a library providing common algebraic and categorical abstractions to Elixir. Monoids, functionals, monads, arrows, categories, and other dark magic right at your fingertips. See? So functional programming, it's a lot of things. There is category theory and many more things. I, I, I don't know even half of what's here. I just want to, uh, my, my point is always, I, I want to talk, I want to bring more, pe more people to the community. I want to bring beginners. So I try not to burden, bur burden them with lots of more abstract concepts. I just like to keep with the simple things. 
right? So I believe it's now time, 10, 10 a.m. here. Maybe it's 4 p.m. in Kenya. Thank you very much, everyone. If you have any more questions, I, I'll, I'll be delighted to, to answer any other question if you need me. But I believe that was the time that you have. How can I say that? I, 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 I'm always trying to find, I think in Portuguese and I, I'm trying to translate it to, to, to English. I mean, the, the time that you have separated, not separated, it would be something that you, you'd say in Portuguese, but it's time that you have scheduled for this talk, it's over. But if you want anything else, I'm here. Um, okay. If, if that's all for now, then thank you very much, Adolfo, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today. We were fortunate enough to have a well-known professional on our team. It's been a pleasure having you contribute your valuable time and thoughtful insights. So I owe a huge debt of gratitude to everyone who took part in this webinar and moved around to make it happen, both participants and organizers alike. Uh, again, let me say how pleased we are to have you Adolfo in the webinar. We appreciate you being here. It has been a true pleasure having you here. Otherwise, everyone else, um, have a great day ahead, everyone. For some of us on our end, it's have a great evening. And it's almost Saturday, so have a great weekend. Sorry, I, I, I didn't understand. I was just saying, have a great weekend. Ah, yes. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Have a great weekend too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.